Welcome, everyone. This is a special effort and a special episode of the Cognitive Science Show uh, because we're going to bring to a close the Transcendent Naturalism series. There's been a bit of a gap since we re released the most recent episode, which was quite a while ago. Uh, but we had always intended, uh, Greg and I had always intended that Layman and Bruce would come on and give their reflections on the series as a whole. They're both uh, well positioned to give a uh, very deep reflection. And so uh, Greg uh, reached out to me and said, you know, John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right. I said, yeah, you're right. We need to make this happen. And so he worked with uh, uh, my EA and we got this uh, booked. And so uh, here we all are, myself, um, my ongoing colleague and partner in all of these projects, Greg Enriquez, uh, two good friends of mine, Layman Pascal and Bruce Alderman, who I had the great pleasure of meeting in person uh, not that too long ago at the Ian Miguel Chris conference in, in San Francisco. So welcome, gentlemen. I will now turn things over to Greg, and then we will proceed. Lovely. Um, well, it's a beautiful opportunity to connect with my dear friends, Layman and Bruce, uh, in the context of this conversation and summarizing transcendent naturalism. What I just thought I'd do is just give a little finalizing recap uh, then we'll hand it over. Uh, I think Bruce has some uh, prepared marks and Layman can riff and then we can uh, dialogue. So just to summarize, uh, to bring us together, uh, John and I laid out transcendent naturalism as having a four kind of interrelated components uh, at the broad level. Uh, one is there's a layered ontology um, and that layered ontology needs to be considered in relationship uh, to a conformist theory of knowledge, uh, whereby we're basically framing our, our cognitive epistemic or apparati in relationship to the layered ontology of nature uh, to create a conformist structure. That conformist structure needs to be understood as a transjective. Um, and ultimately that, that we framed as extended naturalism and that extended naturalism can then be situated in a chirotic moment um, that potentially affords a collective strong transcendence uh, meaning a collective awakening, a collective awareness, a collective transition uh, and transformation into the way we're thinking about ourselves, uh, especially perhaps in light of what I call the enlightenment gap, uh, the failure of our knowledge systems to conform matter and mind in a coherent way. Uh, and then, of course, we have the meaning and mental health crises as related, uh, perhaps downstream consequences. We've had great guests so far. Uh, we started with Rich Bundell and Rita Ledoux talking about both art and the concept of naturalism, a deep naturalism broadly defined. Uh, we went to Brendan Graham Dempsey to get a meta-modern view of meaning making. Uh, we shifted over to Brett Anderson, who gave us a fascinating analysis of uh, complexification, criticality, uh, some Jordan Peterson reflection. And we went to Jordan Hall uh, thinking about uh, various languages, naturalism, uh, and, and a frame that he offered in relationship to different kinds of ways of framing sacred language, uh, transactional language, and family language. Then we talked to Matt Segal uh, and got a process ontology view. Uh, and I think that rounded out uh, a very uh, nice picture. And it's lovely then uh, to bring it home uh, with Layman uh, and Bruce. Uh, so thank you guys uh, for sharing. That's the basic setup. Uh, and here we are, and I'd love to get your feedback. And I want to thank everybody for your participation in the Consilience Conference a couple of weeks ago. That was a, a, jo a joyful experience for me, and uh, I really appreciate you guys contributing that. I'll just throw that in there also. So there's the summary. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to hand it off to you two to start this process of sharing your thoughts, and then we can riff from there. Wonderful. For I just want to thank you up front, give you a ton of appreciation for the Transcendent Naturalism series and all that you've unfolded through it. It's just been Excellent, uh, really great work. And uh, since Brendan touched on a metamodern perspective, uh, Layman straddles multiple worlds, as I think we all do. Um, so I, I thought it would be interesting to focus on, since especially since we did a Rethinking Religion series with John, where we were looking at the intersection of post-metaphysical spirituality and the religion that's not a religion. Um, I wanted to give kind of a an IPS, I'm going to call Integral Post-Metaphysical Spirituality IPS. It's too much of a mouthful. I'll call Transcendent Naturalism TN, so that'll make it a little bit easier. But I have a, a just a little intro that I wanted to give to kind of orient how this landed from uh, a, an IPS perspective and then open to wherever this goes. Um, so I, I feel 
basically consonants concord with all of, of what you presented, not only personally in my own life and explorations, but in relationship to what I and others have been calling IPS or integral post-metaphysical spirituality. And to test out my sense of fit between TN and IPS, I called a friend and a longtime IPS thought partner yesterday and explained the whole sequence of arguments and moves that define your transcendent naturalism proposal, just to see how he responded and, and where it landed for him. And he said, yep, that's it. <laughs> that's what we've been up to. Um, <laughs> but not that the projects um, or the supporting arguments um, are identical in any way. They have significant areas of difference, both in emphasis and in sourcing or thought lineage. And I think here is one of the areas where there's going to be probably a lot of room for mutual uh, benefit. Uh, but there's still definitely a very notable overlap. I've mentioned before to John my sense of there being a sort of multipolar convergence, the co-arising of very similar insights and sensibilities, proposed strategies and so on is happening at different places and in different communities, seemingly simultaneously, or at least without um, much knowledge of one another. And, and that strikes me as significant. It, it suggests to me something about the needs of our chirotic moment. Uh, so for this opening statement, I'd like to look at, at the different pieces of the TN proposal from the lens of IPS. And I see TN and IPS kind of converging at a similar point from different starting places. To be a little simplistic about it, I, I'd say TN starts from a natural science perspective, notes the multiple crises we face, the meaning crisis, the fragmentation of psychology, the meta crisis, the destabilizing challenges of the emerging fifth joint point, and then asks if there are resources from within our present scientific understanding of the world that can serve the same wisdom orienting, meaning providing, and transformative roles for people that religious systems once did. And in that process, TN that may then you know, open itself with a kind of renewed appreciation to past religious and philosophical systems recognizing the things that they got right within their unscientific world frames. And IPS starts more from a humanities position with experience already of the transformative and wisdom orienting potentials of religious and religio-philosophical traditions, but recognizing that a number of the outmoded metaphysical frames that undergird them have come under significant criticism and are impeding their acceptance and their effectiveness in the modern world. And so then from there, there's an interest in drawing on knowledge and insights from the natural sciences, from postmodern and post postmodern philosophy uh, to reconceive the traditions and, and recontextualize their systems of practice to whatever degree necessary for them to fulfill their potential within the contemporary world. Of course, IPS isn't limited to working with existing religious traditions. In articulating the principles it does, it also opens the way towards multiple forms of inquiry and practice that need not depend on existing traditions or involve necessary identification with them at all. So looking at a couple of the different pieces for extended naturalism, uh, one of the one area of immediate convergence between TN and IPS is rejection of the two worlds mythology. IPS wants to leave room for the interplay of transcendence and imminence, definitely, but without needing to posit an unthinkable outside to reality. So it's in strong accord with TN here. I think John's proposed simple move to arrive at an extended naturalism, getting science to more explicitly accept what it already presupposes, is, is genius. There's much more that could be said about that, but I think my simple response is bravo, right? That, that's it. Um, from the IPS side, while it hasn't identified with the naturalist label, it's largely naturalist in orientation, but it gets there through its post-metaphysical stance. Wilbur started advocating for a post-metaphysical approach in the early 2000s, inspired mostly by Habermas. The post-metaphysical orientation is one that takes seriously the critiques of Heidegger, Derrida, Habermas, and others of certain inherited metaphysical stances the metaphysics of presence, the philosophy of consciousness, the philosophy of identity. Um, but it doesn't reject metaphysical thinking altogether, since ultimately that doesn't make sense and I'd argue isn't even really possible. Rather, in Joel Morrison's words, and from what one might call a, a vision logic or a construct-aware orientation, it adopts an a-categorical stance, a willingness and interest to put metaphysics in generative dialogue with empirical science, for instance, and to suspend 
metaphysical claims ongoingly within the field of justification. In that regard, it aims at once for metaphysical minimalism and metaphysical pluralism. IPS doesn't want to encourage unrestricted indulgence in ungrounded, disembodied metaphysical speculation, although it can be fun and, and sometimes fruitful. Um, so it's spare or minimalist in that regard. But it also recognizes that in holding our metaphysical claims provisionally, we need to admit a pluralistic field of metaphysical alternatives and a willingness to explore them. Metaphysical claims are understood in a sense inactively. Are there consequences to adopting a substance metaphysics? What are they? Might we be better served, at least at this time, by a process metaphysics or a relational one? So on. So all of this is very relevant to my own grammatology project, and, and I might come back to that later in some of our discussion. IPS also has many influences, including speculative realism and um, object-oriented ontology. So while with some OOO philosophers, IPS might problematize the concept of nature or natural to some degree, it's similar in some ways to OOO in, in wanting to start in the middle of things, not settling down in the undermining or overmining fields of high metaphysical abstraction, but in some sense remaining close to the middle range of things, of objects, bodies, senses, ecosystems. Schelling once argued, the whole of modern European philosophy since its beginning has this common defect that nature does not exist for it, and it lacks a living ground. So IPS feels it's important to recover this sensibility, and hence it embraces an embodied orientation. And as you've heard from Lehman um, in multiple places, a very broadly shamanic sensibility. You don't have to go far away from this world to find sacredness, depth, mysterious withdrawal, nourishingly intimate presence, and profound transcendence. At once figuratively and literally, it wants to surface the sense of things, to speak in a most post-metaphysical register, uh, meaning one that recognizes our embodiment and embeddedness. We prefer to speak of the sense of the sacred or the sense of the divine, rather than trading in simple or simply given declaratives about God. On the leveled ontology piece, like TN and you talk, IPS acknowledges the need for a leveled ontology. IPS inherits this from Wilbur, of course. Wilbur, inspired by the perennial philosophical concept of the great chain of being, and likely by, likely by E.F. Schumacher's somewhat naturalistic interpretation of it in A Guide for the Perplexed, argued both for a leveled ontology and a leveled psychology or epistemology, recognizing that with different levels of being correspond different levels of forms of consciousness or perception and meaning. With the, with the post-metaphysical turn in Wilbur's work, Wilbur more explicitly argued for the need to critically examine and assess such metaphysical inheritance as the great chain of being. For some of these levels, we can seemingly um, support their existence with empirical evidence. In others, they're, they're bracketed and at least accepted as being available to us phenomenologically, if not yet um, really otherwise confirmable. IPS also entered into dialogue for some period of years with Roy Boscar, particularly around the stratified ontology that he proposes of the real, actual, and empirical, although arguably these distinctions might be better seen as ontological dimensions that are available in different forms across the stack, or at least multiple layers of the stack. For the conformity epistemology, for the past 15 years or so, the tagline for the IPS forum has been participatory spirituality for the 21st century. So IPS is again in pretty strong alignment with TN around the need for a conformity epistemology without, you know, specifically calling it that. And with the need for a transjective uh, grounding that accounts for, again, in Joel Morrison's terms, the symbiogenesis of subject and object. Formative influences have been 4E cog sign, embodied cognitive linguistics, of course, as well as transpersonal and philosophical theorizing of folks like Jorge Ferrer, Donna Haraway, Henrik Skolomowski. And there's a lot that could be discussed from any of those, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll mention a couple other influences. One not likely not well known, and another at least known probably to John. The first is the name I've mentioned a couple times, Joel Morrison, with his interface philosophy. I heard John mention in maybe the first couple early videos in this series a growing appreciation for the word interface. So I wanted to bring in this reference, you know, um, just for that reason. It, it's also been, you know, an important influence on, on aspects of IPS. 
Joel's project is vast and dense, and I can't you know, cover it all here other than to say it's his attempt to, among other things, integrate Spinoza and Leibniz and to make the case for a non-dual rational empiricism with a rich conception of rationality that accords with John's use of it. A central feature of his approach is, of course, the interface, those in-between points of contact separation, contact separation and mediation between domains, between sensible and intelligible, percept and concept, body and mind, imminent and transcendent, infinite and finite. He argues for the need to reunite percept and concept to reground our thinking in the body and the sensible. He uses biolog biological metaphors to describe the growth of conceptual systems, what he calls the embryogenesis of the concept. He has a account of the emergence of the self out of mnemonic primitives and so on. But one thing that I wanted to particularly mention here is his account of the codependence and entanglement of ontology and epistemology which supports a participatory understanding. He uses the yin-yang symbol to pinpoint epistemology and ontology as the two broad opposite domains. And then he puts the ontic as the dark seed within the epistemic and the epistemic as the dark seed within ontology. And epistemolo epistemology or knowing is a real domain. Uh, it's, it's, it's a level of the ontic and an emergent dimension of the real. And ontology, while also real, ontic, is a form of knowing. It's, it's a type of epistemology. So it, 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 it's uh, epistemic. So the ology on each point towards forms of knowing and the ick on each points to the fact that each is a real entity with properties. One other thought partner to mention briefly is John Salas with his philosophy of imagination and the elementals. Like TN and interface philosophy, he wants to expand or re-expand our understanding of rationality, arguing for a transcendental rationality which roots logic back in the body and in the sensible, and can make room for contradiction and paradox, and for an exorbitant logic, a set or a set of logics, which again allows for deeper interface with the imaginal, unconscious, and the paradoxical. The reason I want to um, you know, mention him in this context is uh, the role his elementals of play, uh, again, as mysterious, limit-setting and limit-dwelling, mediating, monstrous, paradoxical entities which set conditions of possibility for the interaction of the sensible and the intelligible in the emergence of perceptual worlds. There's a deep participatory sense to the epistemology he unfolds. And Lehman developed his metaphysics of adjacency independently of these thinkers, and I developed my integral grammatology with its emphasis on the prepositional, the relational, prepositioning non-things that set the clearing for the unfolding of subjects and objects independently of these thinkers as well. But we began to engage with them once people reading our respective work pointed us in their direction. So these are a couple other examples as far as I'm concerned of the multipolar convergence that I was talking about. Um, for real transcendence, I won't really say anything from the IPS side other than, yeah, we agree. There's room for this, and it's meaningful and possible. In IPS circles years ago, we got into a discussion of a whole taxonomy of forms of transcendence, and maybe that's something we can explore. On the sacred, um, on, and the need for a genuine place for the sacred, one that's truly impactful, orienting, and potentially transformative, I want to say I applaud John's recent comments in his discussions about the Silk Road Philosophy Project. One of my small niggling discomforts with the framing of the religion that's not a religion was an overriding engineering sense and an emphasis or an overemphasis even on, on engineering and experience with the sacred instead of a, the mediation of a living encounter. Of course, we can problematize that distinction to a degree, and that's fine. I actually I, I like problematizing it, but I also notice just a subtle shift or change of emphasis in how John is relating to the sacred in his recent work that I, I, I really appreciate and I think will serve this, this project well. And some years back, Lehman and I held a polarity dialogue on the utility of God talk, where we both took positions for it and then we both took positions against it. And in that conversation, we gave post-metaphysical justifications for discarding outmoded pre-modern terminology. But ultimately, I think we both settled on post-metaphysical justifications for continued use of these terms, just in, in, in you know, new context and, and, and with a little bit uh, reframing. So while IPS doesn't come from the same roots, really, as those movements seeking re-enchantment, generally it agrees with the need to indigenously grow a sacramental sensibility, which appreciates the depth, mystery, and sacredness of this world.
Influenced by Panikkar, we've embraced the notion of sacred secularity, the idea that the world of time and becoming of the this worldly is shot through with profundity and meaning. If the sacred is that which holds maximal meaning and value for us, I think one place it is located is in connection and relationship, and another is possibly in the apophatic encounter with unboundedness. Participatory philosopher Henrik Skolomowski describes evolution as, in part, the evolution of modes of sensitivity, the evolution of modes of interface with and participation with reality. To enter more deeply then into sacredness as relation, we can look to those practices which deepen not only participatory sensibilities, but participatory capacity. And in this context, he advocates for the development of what he calls reverential sciences. For the apophatic encounter with the unbounded, um, object-oriented ontology confronts us with it in its description of withdrawn objects. In my view, with the withdrawal of, of objects and beings is that which actually pulls us into love. Because in the unpossessibility of a thing, we must then open to it anew and receive it as gift. And for me, it is love that mediates such an encounter. Joel Morrison also has an interesting idea that the infinite is right with us um, and he uses philosophical and mathematical tools to argue for the identity of infinite divisibility and indivisibility. Infinite divisibility of reality is basically its indivisibility. It's, 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 uh, you know, unbounded wholeness. And through that, he discloses uh, presence of the infinite in the mundane. And I think there's a lot of philosophical moves that you can make that begin to bring that home for people. Um, the last piece that I, you explored in your um, unfolding of transcendent naturalism was application. And I'm not going to expound on that here. I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, I think that's really where it, it all of this gets really important. And, and I, I look forward to exploring that. So that um, brings up... Uh, Brings, brings me to the end of, of what I wanted to say just to set up an IPS framing and, and reaction to and holding of the whole TN project. Wow. Yep. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> that was very impressive. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a couple of things that uh, uh, if I could just uh, highlight them, uh, certainly, uh, but move over to layman. But um, so right off the bat, I, especially coming off the Consilience Conference, love the uh, positioning of science and humanities in, in relation uh, and the moving toward uh, from various perspectives. Uh, and then the way you grounded that, you know, the, the way uh, metaphysics is being framed uh, is it, very similar, actually, to the way I feel like I'm framing metaphysics in a new synthesis uh, in the sense that I'm actually pulling science towards a descriptive metaphysics, um, whereby as opposed to um, dropping some of the more um, esoteric claims from it and grounding it. And so th there were elements there that sounded uh, uh, very, very commensurate. And again, bridge building uh, between different elements. Um, and by the way, the yin yang, ontic epistemic, I just used that in a blog I did on the meme flower to show a dialectical, uh, relation, uh, between ontology, epistemology, metaphysics, and empiricism as well, uh, to create a, a specific bridge in relationship to there. Um, so, uh, those are just some, uh, immediate, uh, um, elements of intertwined synchronicity almost, uh, in ways that were warming my heart. We'll put it that way. So. And I'll just give one brief response other than my wow, uh, which is, uh, uh, Bruce, you're exactly right. Uh, we just did a conversation, Christopher Master Pietro and I, with uh, uh, with uh, Andrew Sweeney, the Philosophical Silk Road, and it'll come out on my channel. And Chris put his finger on exactly what you just said, and that is, ex and I was overjoyed that he did that, and I'm glad that you see that too. That is exactly the shift from a top-down engineering stance uh, to much more of a uh, putting oneself in service of the advent of something that has a life of its own. Um, and that's very, so you put your finger on that exactly to the point. Um, so I just wanted to uh, share with you that that landed uh, exactly right. Well, I will, I think, keep this short and just try to touch on a few of the uh, themes that have come up for me in listening to this series and also congratulations for completing it, bringing it to an end. That's got to feel pretty good. Uh, um, the P in integral post-metaphysical spirituality is um, flexible. You can get involved in it at various different degrees. It can just mean 
um, focusing more on the practices than on the ideology. It can mean trying to have a minimal metaphysics, but you can't have no metaphysics, or it can be taken uh, like we do in the metaphysics of adjacency to be a kind of metaphysical assertion that embodies or enfolds the gesture that the critique of metaphysics is trying to make. But the more interesting part of all of that is how any of those forms of metaphysics colludes with um, individual embodied practice and collective meaning making and mobilization in the world. So another way to say that is we're looking at what is the minimal set of metaphysics that is required for a kind of a theology, a theology that navigates the sacred dimension that is produced when all of the different types of legitimized human sense making are brought together around what you guys call a conformist theory of knowledge. And I think that the sort of natural science frame is a really useful threshold to attempt to do this um, speculative integration of all of the different knowledge and enactment of knowledge domains, which in my model of religion is how you have to do religiousness. You have to bring together those social genres. I think there's something like a God that needs to be considered. Uh, obviously that's a topic I've am focused on a lot lately, but what is the central overflowing justifying nexus at the heart of how all of these different justification systems are related to each other. Uh, when it comes to the layered ontology aspect, it's really interesting to look at that difference between the psychosocial layers that people like Wilbur focus a lot on and the basic ontological layers um, that the UTOC model has situated really nicely. And to look at that in that yin yang sense of some of them seemingly being like, what is the ontology of a cultural and psychological layer, which is fundamentally a kind of epistemic enactment? But then what is the interpretive or epistemic dimension of something that we think of as a fundamental ontological layer of reality? And when we think of reality as being kind of vertically stacked and layered, how much attention are we paying to the different kinds of complex, rhizomatic, organic, mutually enfolding, mutually reinterpreting types of interactions between those layers? And how much attention are we paying to uh, what we might think of as orthogonal dimensions to that vertical stack. So we can do a lot of, a lot of the heavy lifting for a reality model can be done bottom up through emergent processes, but you're always going to need some top down um, presumptions in order to anchor that. But what other dimensions are involved? Are there, is there the possibility for parallel types of ontology operating across all of those layers of an up, down, and bottom, top, down, bottom, up stack moving in two directions at the same time. The naturalism piece I think is really important. Obviously it touches into the sciences and it extends beyond what we normally think of as science when we do a non-reductive, multimodal, multi-dimensional kind of science. But I think there's a lot of room still to touch on the naturalness element of naturalism, or I would like to take it into sacred naturalness, into shamanism, into the need for a normative ethic and aesthetic that's related to how humans and ecologies optimize for each other. And also when it comes to this bit about the chirotic moment, one of the things that's I think important in speaking about a chirotic moment is not to have an an immature fantasy, as many people do, that there's going to be a magical moment of depth, wisdom, and transition where the species just wakes up and everything is fine. A lot of people have stories like that. But this is a long project. It's a deep work, and it doesn't transform everybody magically all at once. It needs particular types of people to do particular kinds of work. And so one of the questions that's always with me is, who is it that we need? Who are the workers of the chirotic moment? Who do we need in order to instantiate 
transcendent naturalism in order to instantiate some kind of new religiosity, right? Who are the meta theologians and meta priests? What are their necessary characteristics? How do they relate to the rest of the population in order to try to set up a system like this? And like we've been saying, not a system that is the top down engineer like structuring of a new narrative and a new ritual system, but the cultivation of an organic bottom up system that is similar to the way that our ancestors slowly evolved the religionization of their culture, but at the same time, also much faster than how they did it and much more secured as a knowledge than they had, because we need to be able to do it very reliably and very quickly and sidestep a lot of the regressive and pathological forms that frequently beset people who were doing this over human history. And so all of that for me uh, comes together in the notion of a, I think I used this phrase at the Utah conference, uh, strong transcendence with preeminent imminence, right? We need the social and individual organism capacities to access a variety of types of strong transcendence um, phenomenological, quasi-ontological, heart, mind, and body access to excessive conditions of love and being and identification with a change that goes beyond our justified identities. But we need to be able to do that in a manner that embraces the finite bounds of the world that we're in. The natural science world has boundaries which make it potent. Uh, Bruce touched on this as well, right? We can't put the strong transcendence in a place that is outside our reality framework. If we do that, we end up with a metaphysics that contains the seeds of its own regression. And this is Nietzsche's point that the highest values devalue themselves given enough time. The, 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 the divinization function in whatever theological proto-metaphysics is necessary in order to religionize uh, natural science, multimodal cosmology, it has to be in here with us. It has to be emergent and imminent and intrinsic to reality. And, and how that interacts with the forms that seem to feed back to us from the beginning or the outside of things has to be very carefully inspected in order to do that. Uh, yeah, that's just a ramble of my responses to the series. <laughs> Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Um, I like that idea of a, a minimal metaphysics that um, supports a, a uh, inventio of theology. Um, I think that's important. Um, one of the things I've been doing elsewhere has been arguing, I recently did this again um, with uh, David Schindler and Ken Lowry and Jonathan Pajot. Uh, it's on Ken's channel. It's going to come out on mine on AGI. And uh, I went through more carefully the argument I've been making that theology is the discipline that will help, uh, that will be needed for dealing with AGI because our relationship to ultimate reality, our ability to transcend and uh, and to reinterpret ourselves um, and to deal with um, the ways in which these things can trigger profound kinds of despair uh, and dehumanization in people. And uh, so I think um, that's part of the Kairos, of course, is the potential uh, advent of AGI. And the open question, a deep, deep disturbing ambiguity about whether or not the advent of AGI is aligned, orthogonal, or antagonistic to the advent of the sacred. And uh, th that's a profoundly theological question uh, to my mind. And uh, so having a metaphysics that can support a, a, a reinventio or an inventio of, an, of theology, um, I think that's a very good implication to draw out from this. The idea about the imminent transcendence, I mean, that has been running through all the work um, around this series. Um, uh, around uh, finite transcendence, um, Plato's argument that you have to have a tonos that holds the two together. Um, I'm, I'm in for the Hellcane Academy. I'm doing uh, Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond, and we've did uh, Nishida recently, and his his contrast between the transcendent transcendent and the imminent transcendent. Um, whereas the transcendent transcendent is very much the two worlds mythology, the beyond, 
limitation, um, which is always an invitation to hubris or a pr provocation of despair because it's unreachable, it's incommensurable, it's absurd. Uh, both of those are, I, I agree, uh, those are, I think, unjustifiable and intolerable, and therefore an imminent transcendence is what we're arguing for here. Um, and I like that, a strong transcendence with, uh, what did you say, uh, uh, a prominent? Preeminent. Uh, eminent? Preeminent. Eminence. Preeminent. <laughs> eminent. Oh, nice play on words. Very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, preeminent. Uh, I, I, that's totally right. Um, I think um, that one of the, th the crucial theological philosophical questions of our time, uh, which, of course, echoes back to Plato, but we have to bring it up to speed for us, is um, how do we hold on to finite transcendence, given that both the finitude and the transcendence are being put into methamphetamine uh, 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 cycles right now? How do we do that? Um, and uh, doing a lot of what, what you're talking about, uh, Lehman, I think is very, uh, very important. Um, Bruce, I, I, I appreciate uh, that was extremely complex, but not unclear in any way. It was very crystal clear, your presentation, uh, line by line. Um, I just can't hold it all in mind. Um, but the general overall argument, um, I agree with Greg. Um, I think the, the greater sort of meta convergence between uh, transcendent naturalism coming out of the scientific framework and IPS coming out of the humanities, I think that is a needed thing. Um, I think that's very much a needed thing, um, especially if we're going to bring about the true consilience. I'm also teaching another course right now online called uh, the literature of the meaning crisis, and uh, and um, then then the imp important role that literature and poetry and drama and art uh, have to play. Uh, and part of the argument there is there's of course a lot of arguments about you know prioritizing the non propositional, etc. You you've heard me make those arguments before, but there's a more recent argument around the fact. Well, arguments and evidence are, are necessary. The overwhelming evidence is they do not actually change people, right? They may, they may scaffold uh, something else that is driving the change. They may give people an integration process for the change or a justification process so they can maintain it. But what seems to really bring about metanoia in people is confronting other people who are living lives that they find attractive. Uh, and I think this is... One of the things that art profoundly can do for us, art broadly construed, is needed. And I think, therefore, we need something like IPS that has a humanities um, allegiance or uh, provenance. It has a humanities provenance uh, precisely because we need something that will bring, bring people in uh, that are from coming from an artistic framework, but an art that is again seeking the sacred, I would put it. Um, mm -hmm. And TN, because of Greg and myself, our orientation isn't uh, that good. We speak about it and we welcome it and we make theoretical space for it, but we don't exemplify um, the kind of provenance or, or the language that would be helpful. Of course, that is why we had uh, Rick and Rita in, uh, right? We wanted to. Uh, uh, make that clear. Uh, but m being welcoming and being affording aren't the same thing. And I think what IPS is doing, if I understand your arm argument correctly, is affording uh, two other dimensions, um, which one is, of course, the artistic. And then there's one that intersects much more with Greg than with me, which is the therapeutic uh, dimension. Um, and so that is greatly appreciated. Um, then I'll pass things back to uh, to Greg. Yeah, I mean, that, those uh, touched on a number of different pieces. I, I would like to hear maybe a little bit of what you've seen um, uh, from sort of the humanistic side of, of gripping people or ways in which we could think about um, bringing these set of ideas in an imminent, embodied, participatory way. Um, those would be some of the things that I would, you know, if you were to say, well, what would be ripple effects extend Seeing somebody do artwork based on this, you know, uh, uh, seeing um, stories be told in particular kinds of ways that uh, sort of capture aspects of the ethos and logos and mythos that we've laid out, um, those be really fascinating. Uh, so to me, those kinds of bridges, if this would be sort of something that's genuinely holistic, genuinely consilient, ultimately those bridges would have to be realized. Well, like, I mean, so we're starting with Moby Dick. 
mm. which meets everything you just said um, in terms of, uh, and I was trying to make a distinction about how you have the linear of narrative, but you have all what's happening in parallel. And what you have is you have this massive network of illusion and ambiguity, and and then you have it captured in uh, uh, characters who uh, represent a particular stance and a particular orientation that you can internalize and indwell and look through and look at reality through their eyes. Um, and you can get contrast between character that carry that kind of non-propositional persuasion because it's like, oh, I was attracted to what Ahab, but then I realized I, I pulled back and, and, and I was attracted to Ishmael because I sort of sympathized, but then I also pulled back. And then where are you when you're pulling back from those two? That's not the same thing as an argument, right? But it's like what Nishida talks about, where you, where you get, you become more aware of your standpoint, the, 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 the sort of presumed place of, in, you know, system of intelligibility, your fundamental sort of indexicality of who and what you are and where you are. And I think that, um, I mean, I'm happy to send you, uh, uh, you know, the videos for free uh, of uh, of the lectures if you want, Greg, because I'm trying to, like, we're, go we're going through, and, but there's a, there's a, there's a, I've made this explicit. I said, we're looking at all this literature that really is about the advent of the meaning crisis, you know, uh, Moby Dick, The Heart of Darkness, Death in Venice, um, you know, The Plague, um, uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, some poetry, but the idea is, but that should serve as a call for literature that's about the advent of the sacred that will help awaken us from the meaning crisis. And when I said that, it was really interesting. People's eyes sort of lit up. They were really appreciative of the first, and they saw a value in that above and beyond the philosophy and the science. And we, we talked about that quite a bit. But this idea that another function of this is to open people up. Uh, to a creative endeavor that was also very well received. Yeah, I resonate with a, a lot of this. Uh, my own background was in creative writing at university, and I was going to go that direction for a while, and I didn't. But uh, uh, two things that are popped up that I really wanted to respond to. One is the you know the emphasis that you mentioned on theology and the role that it will play uh, in in you know probably this fifth joint point period that's unfolding with AI. And uh, I've appreciated what Catherine Keller, uh, I, I don't know if she self-identifies as a polydox theologian, but that's what I call her. They've got a book about polydox theology. Uh, she's a really wonderful writer and thinker, very deep. But one of the things that she's commented on repeatedly is the privileged position that she feels herself occupying as a theologian. Um, not as a psychologist and not as a philosopher, um, because she feels that she's walking a seam in the culture that allows her to dip into the mythopoetic with more freedom <laughs> and to move into the, you know, the scientific and the, and the spectrum. So it, it's, a, it's a privileged kind of position where there's a little bit more uh, freedom to bring, I think, these different domains into a kind of consilience than you can get away with in some of the uh, more boundary disciplines, um, especially if you're in a more progressive um, milieu for, for, for religion like she is. Um, so that's one piece. And at the consilience conference, uh, I gave my little talk on TSK and it interface with you talk, um, time, space, knowledge, vision. But in part of the TSK literature, one of the, one of the arguments is that, uh, stories are what systems feel like from the inside and that we can give propositional accounts of of systemic relationships of multiple elements of things together and that is helpful in scout you know in scaffolding thinking and in you know um helping you test out lines of, of you know logical consistency and things like that but the story and art itself helps you move into that gestalt of of um you know complex interrelationality in a way that kind of bypasses the, you know, the left brain and allows you to really more holistically grasp that field um, in a way that I think moves and shifts you from, from the inside. And so there's some literature in TSK around how, uh, you know, really democracy and, and, and the, the functioning of a well-functioning society depends on the skillful 
use and navigation of stories to really open up, um, uh, you know, possibilities for for meaning and for relationship and for dissolving certain kinds of boundaries that, from a propositional frame, you you wouldn't want to entertain. But within art, um, you can feel it first, and then um, so that's just you know one one resonance point of resonance I wanted to bring up. Yeah, what point of resonance I'll, I'll share in terms of sort of the participatory embodied element. Um, we've done a few things, Masi and I in particular, my partner in, in relationship to trying to embody, bring forth you talk. And uh, I think one of those powerful things has been this theory of the week we developed. Uh, so today's Void Darkness Day um, prior to the, that's why I'm wearing black <laughs> on our Void Darkness Day. Um, and then the energy information of tomorrow, matter, object, life, organism, mind, animal, culture, person, uh, and then God, moon, in terms of what is a theological, sacred potential uh, of beyond. And then the universe dies again and is reborn. Uh, and so uh, to me, I think one of the things that we need to be exploring and looking at in this sort of conciliant bridge between sciences and humanities from both directions is exactly um, what are the embodied ritualistic participatory themes uh, in the form of narrative, in the form of practices, in the form of calendars, uh, and wonder uh, about how certain aspects of uh, TN, uh, integral post metaphysical spirituality, could be you know ingrained, embedded, and brought to life uh, through some of those uh, things that we live by. Yeah, for me that uh, just before Layman speaks. Yeah, as you many of you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on ritual. I'm going to be doing a series with Zevi Savlin. Lavin and um, Justin Sledge, um, trying to bring some of the larger YouTube channels talking about religion uh, and mysticism together around this topic of ritual. Um, and then, of course, uh, Pickstock and other people and, all, and the astonishing work that Gregory Shaw has done with Theurgia about liturgy, about the binding of, of ritual into other systems of intelligibility like the calendar. That's what you're doing, Greg. You're binding ritual into a system by which uh, we make intelligible sense of time um, and season and the, the, and the, and the processes of change. Um, so I think that's very, very important. Um, and I think this is, again, a domain, as Bruce made it very clear. That's a very good argument, Bruce, about how polydox theology can uh, walk the seam. I like that language. Uh, but theology is also the place where people are um, best disposed to talk about liturgy. Uh, we have great philosophers like Pickstock and others who are, are doing that work now, you know, after philosophy and, um, and uh, sort of after writing and, and the, the, the liturgical consummation of philosophy and things like that. But of course, she's also a theologian. I think all of this is relevant. And I'm just sort of also talking to Phil Time, hoping that Layman will get back with us. Uh, he's trying I guess to it's his right turn now. to have the yeah. reset. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> we'll I, I mean, it, uh, I'll, I'll wait to hear what Layman said. Uh, and um, but that that's sort of my reflection. And the 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 problem I see just to introduce a little bit of noise into the and the wonderful party we're having um, is that the discipline we most need is. is if these arguments are all correct, is, is this theology. But the problem is that this is also to some degree the discipline that is bound uh, to a moribund uh, two worlds mythology and a moribund substantialist uh, metaphysics. In, 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 in traditional theism, and this is where Schellenberg's work on, you know, thick, strong models of the sacred, um, as he puts it, you know, very, a thick model, a thick description, Geertz is a very rich, complex description strong model of the sacred is the triple transcendent. It's ultimately real, ultimately transformative, and ultimately normative for you. Um, and he says that, you know, the, the, that uh, theos, traditional theism, or what we might call common theism right now, is that strong, um, that thick strong, and he advocates for um, um, thin strong. We should have a thin as you both are saying, a minimal metaphysics, I mean, a very flexible, creative thing, but it should be oriented towards a strong uh, ultimism. And the reason why he argues for that is he says, 
Um, if you lack any one of these, you're leaving out important experiences of transformation that are precisely going to be the engines we need right now. I think that's a really good argument. And so I think, although I'm saying th theology, and I mean it seriously, it's a, it's a, it's a post-theistic, not pantheistic, a post-theistic theology, non-theistic if you want, insofar as it's going for the thin, strong orientation towards the sacred rather than thick, strong orientation. That's so, awesome. I mean, the open, the open, open question is whether theology will be up to the job, whether or not it can, it, it can do that active self-transformation that we all need it to do. Well, I think upstream from that question is, um, what are the conditions under which the theology is being generated and explored, right? What are the physical, yeah. mental yes. health and emotional and yes. body conditions for the individuals, but also what is the community of people out of which these theologies will be generated? If those are more open and more capable of being flexible and multidisciplinary and using a minimal reliance on a fundamental architecture of reality, then they can do this really well. If those are um, rigid and problematic and have bad forms of dialogue, then we're going to get the old patterns regenerated. Excellent. Well said. Perfectly said. Bruce, could you say, in conjunction with that, could you say a little bit more about what polydox, I think is that what you called it, polydox theology is? I've never heard that before, and it immediately resonated with me. Yes. Uh, there are, uh, you know, a series of thinkers. Uh, they're they're loosely associated with process theology, right? But they are are not, you know, I would say not exclusively focusing or or referencing that. Uh, but they do generally converge around um, questions of how understandings of complexity and of complex relations between ontology and epistemology, and um, you know, kind of sacramental thinking, ecological thinking. All of these things um, intersect and, and interpenetrate with um, theological thinking. I would say for the most part in what I've read from them, Sharon Betcher and Roland Faber and, yeah. you know. Faber, I'm reading. I'm reading okay. Faber right now, yeah. Okay. So they all, you know, kind of are, are writing in, in, in shared circles. And a lot of it seems, in my view, to point towards a non-theistic theology more than that. Um, I think they really are beginning to enact that kind of space, um, thought space. Um, and it, 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 there, for me, there's a lot of promise there. Uh, I, I had maybe two little points I want to throw out, but I want to hear what you're thinking about that polydox and why, why that's landing for you. But uh, one in, you know, Layman talking about, uh, you know, we need maybe some kind of intermediaries or, or, or uh, figures, kind of priest figures or, or other kind of figures that can be acting in society. And of course, I think that, you know, probably can set off alarm bells for people. Yep. Um, but uh, Roger Walsh, uh, you know, psychologist, transpersonal psychologist and a thinker out of, uh, I think is um, UC Irvine. Uh, he's argued for the need for, in our culture, what he calls Gnostic intermediaries. Um, he doesn't mean Gnosticism, but he means... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah those who can walk in between disciplines and and bring in an appreciation for for you know deep knowing and wisdom um and uh, uh you know steve march he's appeared on on your channel and he's been part of the consilience conference and i went through a number of levels of his uh training with aletheia and I've joked with him that he's training in a whole army of Ngakpas. You may not know what a Ngakpa is, but in Tibetan tradition, it's a, a deep yogi who doesn't have any tie to particular lineage or monastery or anything like that, but they move and navigate rather freely in society and they marry, but they have a pretty deep esoteric tantric and other kinds of training. And I really think that in a very secular way, he's, he's, he's cultivating a, an army of Nakbas to go <laughs> out into corporate world. Um, one other little piece I was going to mention is that Layman and I were, I was originally part of the project and, and Layman and joined me with it. It was called the Foundation for Integral Religion and Spirituality. And mostly because we didn't have really the, the resources to do it, even though it, it actually had a promising start. But the, what I wanted to mention about it here was the role that we were envisioning for it to play. 
And we actually found um, an organization that was working with us that provides ordinations to people. And the, the model that we were building was a model of coordination of ministers. Where oh, they nice play on words. That's yes. wonderful. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just got to clap for that. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was the idea was to work with people from any kind of tradition and um, basically kind of open them up to this IPS integral kind of thinking. And, you know, um, well, I would now say transcendent naturalist kind of thinking and, you know, to to really but not to impose any kind of outside structure on them, but to enter into a dialogue so it it grows in the way that it means something within their own tradition, but that there's a certain set of parameters that we establish around, you know, you can be coordained in this and you can be coordinated with others through a, a particular curriculum. So we were building that curriculum and working with an organization. And I do really think that there could be this role for this kind of interstitial um, uh, you know, organization or way of doing things. I like that. I'm very interested in that. Maybe we can talk about it at another time, but that's very, very, that's very, very juicy. That's very good. I think there's a number of those sorts of products, uh, projects on the horizon, like the Church of the Intimate Web, but also I'm working with Bonnie around the formation of this new divinity school. So there's a number of people in this space and there have been for years various attempts of which the Foundation for Integral Religion and Spirituality was one of the first, trying to think how you um, act as quality control and training and promotion and interlinking for the kinds of people we need and have them operate as cultivating influences across multiple different kinds of traditional and non-traditional arenas. The kind of people who can help whatever your approach is, you think you're theist, you think you're atheist, you think you're Hindu, you think you're Jewish, whatever it is, they can all be made better and more resonant with the kind of universe that transcendent naturalism is promoting um, with the kind of health and embodiment and interpersonal practices that we all see that they need. So I think where what we need to do is not just co- <laughs> ordinate and co-ordain, but bring together a kind of armada of people who are motivated to undertake these kinds of projects, keep them in tandem with each other. But essentially, um, I think one of the things that's really important is, yes, these this is a kind of a non-theistic approach, but it's not a completely non-theistic approach. It's a way of handling theism or non-theism. It's open to cultivating with whatever forms and traditions are available. Because although there will be generation of new myths, new versions of archetypal stories, new kinds of narratives, uh, we're not going to get rid of the people who are deeply wed to their inherited traditions or their inherited terminologies and symbol sets. So the question of how we take all of that into our care and deepen and expand and make more full and more full spectrum, those sorts of people, that's a really important question. And we need really good people verified somehow to be able to do that. And they have to have the right kind of social standing and the right kind of temperament to be acceptable to groups that are usually uh, suspicious of outsiders. That's excellent. That's very well put. I mean, what I'm trying to do with the Philosophical Silk Road is take the courtyard of Dialogos, which is different from the courtroom of debate, and then basically make it a road. Um, and the idea is uh, nobody lives on the road. People travel from one place to the other. They can exit and go to somewhere else that they need to be. But they can also do, they can travel and then return to the home they left from and do Tolkien's recovery. Uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's, see it again for the first time. Um, and, and, and this is this sounds, oh, no, no, no. That's how it's always been. The religions are always transformed with another when another religion it, 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 advents beside them. Judaism changes fundamentally when Christianity is born. Christianity changes fundamentally when Islam is born. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's very much, uh, it, it should be something that allows people to find something they don't have, leave some, somewhere they need to leave and go somewhere else they need to be, but also travel and recover and return home in a way in which they can live in that home uh, deeply and more authentically than they could before. That's the intent, exactly. 
Um, but what you're trying to do, I think, is a is a missing piece of the puzzle. And I, I, I'm really interested in this a lot. But I'm talking too much. I'll let Greg talk. Well, one of the things that uh, Bruce in particular you mentioned, but I think this is implicit, is the curriculum, actually. the One of the things I was really thinking about as we were dialoguing was, uh, like, what's the architectural network uh, of both sort of propositional claims and embodied ritual participatory engagement and individual and group. Uh, and so when you say curriculum, I then jumped up and was like, yeah, it'd be fascinating uh, to have sort of a network of you know, hierarchically arranged concepts, ideas, interrelated uh, that would then that, that would be shared and basically be like, OK, here's where I am in this network. But th these are the interrelated domains of inquiry, of exploration. Uh, mapped out in a particular way. So at some level, maybe we talk about what kind of emerging curriculum, if any work was done in that area. And that's definitely something I, a little, uh, a, a project and the unified theory of knowledge, you know, I've definitely given some thought to what would be uh, the way I would arrange an academy uh, at the level of coming into a university kind of setting. Um, but I'd also really be interested in thinking about it as this sort of, this kind of project, what, what kind of curriculum would be um, uh, recommended both at the propositional level and a participatory level. That was exactly on my mind as I was approaching our conversation. And one of the things, and I think it could be, I know it, it's true for, for any one of us, um, but in approaching this conversation, I was thinking about what to bring in for IPS and, and, and dialogue with, with transcendent naturalism. And I really, I'm getting into a place, I'm, I guess I'm probably getting pretty lazy um, because I really felt very comfortable to leave all of these things existing in a superpositional cloud in my head and what to pull out and to put on paper. And, you know, um, but I really started thinking to do justice to, you know, what has been the IPS project over the last two decades. It would take probably a, a year or a couple year curriculum to really, to really unpack all the pieces of that. And when I think about the texts and the ideas and the insights that are also informing you talk that also inform everything that that John brings to his work and his channel. I mean, that could be one incredible library of of you know convergent visions and 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 lines of thought, lines of flight um, that I you know to me is just inspiring to think about. You know, what would a curriculum around all of those things really look like? Um, uh, you know, because I, I do think, you know, like uh, one one other little piece here is kind of straddling two two sides of things in the way I want to talk about it. But one, you know, the, the, the role that the monasteries kind of used to play in, yes. in the formation of culture. Right. Um, what what can be built that, you know, is is a you know, is is a kind of monastic like entity that is formative, properly culturally formative um, without repeating, you know, the old belief cult thing of you've got to join this and you've got to, you've got to become a member of this, you know, ideological thing. But nevertheless, that could be properly culturally formative. But the other piece about the monastery I was thinking about, this came up when Lehman and I were talking to uh, Andrew Cohen, the spiritual teacher. Um, and, and one of the things that has beset him and, and many other, you could say, experimental emergent spiritual communities Often they exist in isolation, and often a lot of things go wrong. Um, they they live in these bubbles where they're experimenting with things, and cultic, you know, experiment, you know, cultic dynamics emerge, and there's problems that happen. And I I started thinking about you know post, especially post Thomas Merton, what has happened with the the formation of what's now called the Society for Intermonastic Dialogue, or um, where different monasteries from different traditions, not only within Christianity, but, you know, ashrams and Buddhist and other kinds of things, deep contemplatives are all joining this network to learn from what they're doing in their respective experiments at their respective nodes and to really let that be generative among them um, so that we avoid those problems of insularity and cultic dynamics that, you know, typically beset uh, you know, experiments in, in new religion. Um, so I, I really think that there's, you know, multiple roles there. there. There's like that that kind of structure that can be culturally formative and this kind of dialogical networking kind of thing that we need to keep 
keep ideas circulating um, in a way. Uh, but what Raimon Panikkar says that the one of the primary spiritual disciplines for our time, one of the primary sadhanas, is learning to meet meet each other across boundaries. Um, you know, yeah. There's a there's a lot of different elements to avoiding the the cultic or the problematically cultic form of these things. But in what you're saying there, Bruce, what I hear is the curriculum has to include at least a powerful module for the cultivation of moral intelligence or ongoing integrity practice for individuals. And it has to include uh, an important module of mm, generative, interpersonal, intersubjective dialogue around difficult conversations and around the understanding of power dynamics and how different kinds of scenarios get played out between people. So those would be two essential components of a curriculum. I think that's really important. I just read a paper that's in process from Tom Murray. I don't know if, if all of you know Tom Murray, but he's a wonderful developmental psychologist and a post-metaphysical thinker. He's done a lot of really wonderful stuff on post-metaphysical thinking and spirituality. Um, but he's recently produced a piece where he's looking deeply at what kind of institutional and dialogical um, processes can be put in place for leaders of organizations to receive feedback from the community, especially when they're not open to that feedback. How do we develop structures that actually um, promote um, you know, the, the kind of shadow work and other kinds of things that are, are necessary within institutions to guard against that. And I think that's maybe moving a bit of a tangent direction, but it's it's part of that curriculum that you're talking about. Well, I like, I mean, we're, I don't know how tangential it is, uh, but I mean, they made a very uh, powerful point about we're doing this sort of epistemological, ontological work, um, but that we need to have a corresponding work of the formation of individuals. Um, now, what I, I heard him talking about something like a church, and then you made a, a, a very good correction to it, right? We 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 have sort of uh, something like a clergy that he was talking about that can move, but we also need a monastery. Um, um, and I think I, I don't think this is tangential at all. There's something between you know the universities where you're doing the epistemological ontological work, at least when it's supposed to be working, it's largely not working anymore, right? And then. Uh, and then uh, the church is where that work that layman is pointing to is 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 living out. I mean, that that that's always what the priest was doing. I mean, in some, it, admittedly more sc small scale, but the priest was always weaving between different people coming in from different walks of life and trying to get them to commune together in a way that was healthy and worked. We're talking about ideals here, right? Okay, not not, not right. And then the, with, the, the monastery is yeah yeah, but we need people who are sort of. You know, psychonauts and spiritual explorers, and but also, you know, really trying to work out a rigorous fashion of of that, and they all have to talk together. Um, so I, I think, uh, Bruce, it's actually very pertinent how this discussion has gone. I I think that um, I think we are hungry for. Well, sorry, I've made the argument that we're hungry for those missing institutions, and that we basically only have um, the university sort of left as an. Um, uh, we'll come back to why I say that about the church in a second. Um, and, and, the, and the university has basically collapsed into the state. Um, the church has largely, um, lost this function. I mean, people still go to church. I'm not stupid, but the church has lost this role as being the play, the community center, right? The, the, the common unity of the community where the different wa walks and ways of life, uh, were, were sewn together by the clergy. Um, and so I think there, in addition to whatever worldview reattunement we're doing, which Greg and I were addressing in Transcendent Naturalism, I think there is this requirement to uh, also, uh, you know, get the, the reformulation of what the church used to do and what the monastery used to do. And, and to take Lehman's point in a way that's not hostile, um. a way that's not hostile to the existing churches and the existing monasteries, as you were pointing to, Bruce. So I don't think it's orthogonal at all. I think it actually fits together uh, in a very coherent proposal.
Okay, well, I think uh, we're moving towards, uh, we're sort of falling into appreciative silence, which is uh, always, a, always, a good, uh, always, <laughs> always a good place to uh, end things. Um, I'm going to uh, maintain our tradition of, um, first of all, thanking uh, Bruce and Lehman. It was wonderful. It was really appropriate uh, to end things with the two of you. We had foreseen that from the beginning. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad we, we were able to bring that to fruition. Um, what you had to say today was really powerful, uh, really summative in, uh, in a lot of important ways. Uh, obviously I want to thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, it was your idea to do this, uh, and a lot grew out of it. Um, and all of these projects have been wonderful. And now I'm going to, I'll turn things over to Greg for his final words. And then Greg will give Bruce and Layman as, a, as is our custom, uh, the final words for uh, this episode and for the series. So say something tantalizingly brilliant uh, <laughs> as your final words. All right. Thank you, hey, Greg. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, well, this has been a, a really uh, powerful series for me. Uh, I really think we laid out, uh, sketched out a architecture for the kind of philosophical transformation that's needed. Uh, I think a layered ontology that's appropriately gripped epistemically uh, in a transjective that affords trans. Uh, strong transcendence is, is a powerful schematic uh, that then grows. I love how we sort of are culminating here in uh, bridging with our brothers and fellowship uh, in the integral post-metaphysical spiritual community because we could see uh, so many different lines of convergence and synergy and then thinking fundamentally about things like curriculum and community um, and then what is going to you know, uh, steal the culture as it were, uh, going forward. Um, and I deeply appreciated, uh, the reflections, uh, that you, Bruce and Layman, as I knew you would, uh, bring to this. So it's been an honor and a joy. Uh, and, uh, and I think we did good work. I think there's more work to be done, of course. Uh, but I'm proud of what happened. So, uh, thank you that, uh, John, and all of our guests. And so I'll turn it over to you, Bruce and Layman, uh, share some final thoughts here as we wrap it up. All right. Well, I also am deeply appreciative of what both of you unfolded in this series and in all the stuff that you do in all your cognitive science shows. It's just so rich and wonderful. It's a it's a real gift, um, and it's it's a it's a delight to speak with with all of you. Of course, uh, Layman's been a, a wonderful thought partner for many years. Um, one of the things that was coming to mind is uh, Alastair McIntyre's call. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're with, yep. you know, his after virtue and his writings there. But one of the things that he's been calling for is we need a new Benedict. Um, we need a new individual who can um, put forward a rule for kind of living and communing together and the need for the reemergence of kind of small, concentrated communities of co-living and study um, for at least periods of intensification um, of, 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 you know, that, that could be formative. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think he's not exactly putting that forward in the context we're describing, but to me it's resonant. And I think he's got his finger on, on something. Um, and I feel that that has been one of the things that bubbled up in our conversation here uh -huh. is, uh, I, I don't know who's, who looks more like a Benedict in here, but maybe one of us. So, um, anyway, thank you very much. It's wonderful as always to be with you. Absolutely. Well, it's nice to see, as always, that a couple of bearded white guys can solve the world's problems. <laughs> the The series you guys have done has been really tremendous, and I think it goes a long way to showing the the natural movement into something like religion that comes out of building uh, an evolving, emergent, coherent, pluralist model of reality. Right. And then what you see is a lot of people who've attempted something similar have stumbled upon many of the same conclusions. So there's there's a group of people, there's a group of thinkers, there's a group of approaches. But the 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 strong overlaps between these different approaches shows us that we're we're getting to grips with something that's really there. And then the natural extension of that throughout the different people you've spoken with into regenerating various classical features of human religiosity has been very intriguing. And it points to the question of how this moves forward as an instantiation, which we've been talking about today. 
How does art move it forward? How do we get a curriculum? What sorts of institutions or monasteries do we need? What sort of people do we need to cultivate to be the tenders of this whole thing? So that's a really exciting place to be. It feels like a launching pad. It feels like uh, a, a structure has been recognized and there's a, a moment of realization, of actualization of all of this coming into play. And it's a moment that will be fascinating. It's a moment in which there's going to be huge creativity and love and experiment and danger. And we're going to have to be extremely careful to prevent regression into all the different kinds of weird cul-de-sacs and pathologies that integrative and alchemical and religious approaches have always fallen into. And yet at the same time, we have to be happy with taking those risks. And so that's a just a very exciting place to be. And I'm very happy to be there with you guys. Lovely. I look forward to seeing you at the end of the month there, Layman, once we wrestle with the concept of God. <laughs> so I'm going to say just a, a final thank you to our audience for hanging in through this series. It uh, was often challenging, uh, but thank you for your time and attention. Yeah. Yeah.